Well, welcome to Druam Baptist Church at Home. And so here we are with another week. And as we always do, we start with the Bible reading, uh, this time from Exodus chapter 19, a shorter reading, only six verses from verses 1 through to 6. So if you would like to uh, open the, your Bibles up and read through that, pause this uh, as you read and then come back again when you've finished. Well, welcome back. As we uh, begin to uh, look through this passage this morning and continue with the story of the Israelites uh, making their way out of Egypt and through the wilderness and now reaching the mountain, uh, I'd like to begin by asking you a question. How are you going? How are we all coping uh, with the isolation caused by the coronavirus? Surely we're all beginning to feel by now that we are missing out on the fellowship we're used to as we would normally have on Sunday mornings or perhaps through our home groups and small groups. And I would hope that through the uh, use of technology, uh, phones, emails, uh, video conferencing and so forth online, that that would go some of the way to alleviate that lack of fellowship. But it, it's not the same and we know that. But hopefully it's better than nothing. And think for a moment, what it would have been like if uh, this had happened 50 or 60 years ago before we had all the technology that we have now. It would have been uh, much more difficult back then, of course. So as we uh, consider the situation we find ourselves in and trying to make do with what we have, I guess it's, it's helpful to think of what the positives might be uh, that could come out of all of this. Maybe one silver lining is that it might help us to uh, appreciate what fellowship is really all about and to look forward to when we can meet back together again. And, and not just to go back to what we always used to know, but perhaps to something that is even better. So as we uh, think about that day when we can finally meet together as a whole congregation, let alone in smaller groups even, um, we have to be aware of what the uh, both state and federal governments are saying to us at this stage that uh, it would seem by the indications they're giving us that it's going to be at least a couple more months before we are all together as a larger congregation. And so we, we need to keep our hopes alive and uh, keeping our eyes on Jesus for, for uh, our time being, for where we're at now, but also remembering that this will pass um, and there will be a, a day when we can meet together again. So as we begin this morning looking at uh, the story again of the Israelites as they continue on with their journey, and we see that they have finally uh, reached the mountain. This was a, a time, a place that they had been looking forward to, hoping for all along. It was this hope that would have kept them going. Remembering, of course, that they had this promise given to them that God would lead them to this very place. And this was the mountain of which they had heard so much about that where Moses had met with the Lord that first time in a burning bush. And so they would have had these stories very much alive and the anticipation building up as they made their way to the mountain. So as they arrived, they realized, of course, that this is not just a something they were hoping for because of a, a great experience they're about to have, but it was the fulfillment of a promise that God had made to Moses. And so here they were, they had arrived, and as they arrived, they were going to be receiving instruction from the Lord uh, through Moses about the kind of people that they were to be. So let's pick it up as we now look at verse 1 and uh, see what it has to tell us. It says, on the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day they came to the desert of Sinai. Or Sinai. And so they had uh, left the, the, the area they had been in and they're making their way. And it had taken them three months actually from, from leaving Egypt right through uh, to arriving at this mountain. The three months of solid journeying with some stops along the way to very quickly refresh and, 
to be nourished and, and catch their breath along the way. Uh, but basically a, a solid journey all the way. And as they arrive, as we said, as, as, we, as I mentioned just earlier, uh, that this, this was the fulfillment of a promise. And we see that in uh, earlier back in chapter 3, Exodus chapter 3. So let's have a look at that. Exodus chapter 3 in verses 10 to 12. And it says, And so now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And so here we see that God was promising that this would be a sign. But there's something unusual about this. You see, normally when we uh, put up a signpost pointing towards uh, something, uh, something we're drawing attention to, we put the signpost well before that item or that place or that event or whatever it is that we're drawing attention to. But here we see that God was saying that this would be a sign after, after Moses and the Israelites had stepped out in obedience and had left Egypt and had made their way to this mountain. And, and arriving there, would, that would be the sign. And so this might seem very strange for us, but we have to realize what's going on here. So what was this about? Why does God do things this way sometimes? Well, for the Israelites, as for us, God was uh, providing them an opportunity to step out in faith. He, he was testing them, but it was it was, it was also an opportunity for them to, to grow in their faith and in their trust in the Lord. So sometimes God does provide us uh, affirmations, confirmations of his will. Uh, and he, he might do that uh, before uh, we step out in faith. But there are other times when God does things in a way that we would not want him to do it, a way that we wouldn't work. And that he is he, he asks us to to step out in obedience to the command before he supplies the confirmation. And I've experienced that, Jeanette and I together, and I'm sure you have too. Now, for the Israelites, they had to uh, leave Egypt before they could come to this mountain, reach the mountain. And that might sound like, well, yes, of course, obvious, but it's important that we don't miss the significance of what was happening here. So leaving Egypt was more than just about a change of location. Leaving Egypt was about leaving behind all their old ways of life, all their old ways of finding significance and security and meaning and purpose, their old way of life. That all had to go. They had to leave that behind. All their old hopes and dreams that all had to go and they had to move forward and allow God to take them to a new place. And at that new place, they would have to gain a new sense of identity, a new sense of purpose, a new way of seeing the world, a new understanding of God. And so this is what we see God was doing as he brought them to the mountain, brought them into his presence around the mountain. And for us, there's something really uh, significant and important for us too, as we see what does this mean for us today? So coming to the mountain, what was it that made that mountain so uh, important, uh, so special? Well, it was just a normal mountain. It was higher than the rest of the mountains in the region, but it wasn't a beautiful mountain to look at. So what made it so important, so special? It was simply the presence of God. That's what made that mountain, a special mountain, the mountain of God, his presence, his holy presence. For us today, it's not about a location, a place that we go to, to find that special connection with God. For us, it's not about our physical location, it's about the focus of our hearts. So what does coming to the mountain mean for us? Coming to the mountain means entering into God's presence. Now we know God is always present. He is always with us. He's, uh, he's within us, around us, but we don't always have that deep sense of 
uh, of knowledge of his presence, that fellowship, that intimacy uh, of God, uh, knowing and being aware of his presence. So coming to the mountain is coming to a place of, uh, of deep fellowship with him. And so coming to the mountain means leaving the, the Egypt behind that we know and coming to enter into God's presence in a deeper way. And we think of uh, James chapter 4, verse 7 and 10. Let me read that out for you. It says, Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. So here we see that there is this sense here of, of just drawing close to God. He says, come near to God, draw close to God, and he will draw close to you. Now, he, he's talking to those that, that should know God. He, he's writing a letter. James was writing this letter to people who were believers. But he was saying there, are, there is a sense and yet we, when we need to draw closer to God. But we can't do that unless we're uh, willing to, to leave our sinful ways behind, our old ways behind. Um, and, and it's important that we understand what that's about. So coming to the mountain does mean that in leaving old ways behind, it could also mean leaving old ways of worship behind. And as we see how things are being uh, shaken up, uh, large changes coming through in society and, and so forth and in our communities and even to our churches, we may need to explore what does that mean for us, uh, even right now, as we're not able to meet together as a larger congregation. Uh, what does that mean for us to worship God in spirit and in truth? It also means coming to the mountain means entering into a deeper relationship coming to a deeper understanding of what the covenant relationship of God is about. What is our relationship with God about when we can't meet together in a building together as one congregation? Am I still part of the people of God when I am separated from the rest of God's people? Do I have a deep sense of, of belonging, of being part of this covenant relationship? And so this is all that is symbolized in this idea of coming into the, to the mountain, coming into the, the presence of God. For the Israelites, coming to the mountain was a sign, as we had said earlier, but it's a sign of God's faithfulness, faithfulness to his word. It's a sign that God was able to deliver them just as he had promised. And so as, as they arrived, they came to realize all that it meant uh, coming to this mountain. Of course, this was a truly great sign uh, because think of how difficult, in fact, impossible it would have been to get to this mountain if God had not done all that he had done to deliver them, to redeem them from the Egyptians and uh, to deliver them safely uh, to this mountain. Uh, it, it would have been an extremely difficult journey. Of course, the opposition of the Egyptians themselves, but also just the hostile environment uh, through which they were hiking. And, and this is a group of people, a very large group of people, uh, with their elderly parents and their young little children and their all their goods and chattels and, and uh, their cattle and, and their flocks and so forth. The, in, a very difficult journey. And yet, here they were. They had arrived. They knew God was faithful. He promised that he would bring them to this mountain and he had done exactly that. And so as we think about what this would have meant for them, uh, we can see that they've arrived and they come to this mountain, this mountain that Moses had taught, taught them about and, and uh, prepared them for. And they had seen how God had got them there and they would have been reflecting back. And I think their hearts would have been filled with awe and wonder and worship for this amazing God who had brought them to this place. Well, we move on and we have a look at uh, verses 3 and 4. And we see how God says that it is he indeed who had uh, brought them there. So as we look here again from chapter 19, verses 
3 and 4. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. And so here we see that the first thing that happens is that Moses is called up to the mountain. And as he goes up and meets with God uh, in, in a very special relationship that he had uh, with God here, we see that the first thing that God does is he, he tells Moses to instruct the people, to remind the people of who they are. That they were here, brought here because of a promise that God had made uh, long ago to their forefather, Jacob, that they were the descendants of Jacob. See, what, what had happened wasn't because it was just some new idea that God had had. It certainly wasn't that. And it wasn't because God decided to have compassion on the Israelites, although God is certainly a very compassionate God. Ultimately, it was because of a plan and a purpose that God had put into place when he made a covenant with their forefather, Jacob. And so God was calling them to remember this. But in remembering that, he was calling them to remember who, who they are. They were the descendants, these very ones that God had spoken of when he made these, these covenants, these promises with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so here they were at the mountain, God's people, gathered to him. And the Lord reminds the people through Moses that the only way that they had made it was because he had enabled them just as supernaturally as he had rescued them and delivered them from the Egyptians. That's how they had managed to make this trip. It was all by his doing. And he expresses it with that lovely expression. He had carried them as on eagles' wings. And I don't know if you've ever seen an eagle soaring across the sky. I've had that opportunity. It's, it's a wondrous, a beautiful thing to watch. Uh, I remember in the Grampians once uh, being perched up on the side of a high hill. And from behind me, uh, this was early in the morning, this uh, eagle, wedge tail, I had just soared out and, and I saw it as it was appearing in front of me. And, and it traveled quite a distance, you know, and it never beat a wing. It never fluttered a feather. It just glided across the sky. It just seemed totally effortless. And this is the picture that God is saying. Although they had a responsibility, surely, they had to do the walking, but they, all they needed to do was to trust God. And he enabled them to make this journey. He carried them as on wings of eagles. But we notice it also says that he brought them to himself. He didn't just bring them to a place. He brought them to himself. And here we have a reminder that, that God is not a God who is far away and distant. He, he's not a God that uh, has some... Uh, desire to, to grab a, a, a group of people and to make something of them as if they're to be his slaves. No, he brings them together to be his people, to, to, to belong to him. And so what we see here as we move on, we have a look at now verses five and six, and we see that as God brought the people to himself, he's, he talks about fellowship. This is really what it's about. It's about God wanting people, his people, to be in fellowship with him, to be in a relationship with him. So let's have a look now at verses five and six. And it says, Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. And so there's several things that we see coming out of this. Uh, first is this, uh, he, he actually explains what the fellowship that he is to have with his people is going to be all about. And the first thing we see is that it's about covenant, being brought into a, a relationship where there is a, a special bond a bond that cannot be broken, and boundaries that will be set around it. 
not, not in a legalistic sense, but the boundaries, the purpose of the boundaries is to protect this relationship, to keep it uh, protected and safe uh, from being broken apart. And so he says his fellowship, the fellowship of his people that they will have with him and with one another will be all about this, this covenant relationship in which God binds himself to his people and they are bound to him because he has redeemed them. They will always be his. But as we see what he goes on to talk about, uh, this, this uh, fellowship, it also means a sense of belonging. And of course, when we have a fellowship, just think of any organization group that talk about having fellowship. You know, often as Christians, we talk about having fellowship and we, we simply mean maybe having a uh, a dinner together or something like that where we have a, a sense of um, friendliness amongst ourselves. But fellowship in this sense is much deeper than that. The, there is a sense of deep belonging. And so when you have a, a fellowship, the word fellowship means a group of people who have a real sense of identity because they belong together. There is something about this that identifies who they are. And so here we see that God said they would be his treasured possession, treasured. This means that out of all the nations in the world, as he said, all the, wor all the world is his, but out of all the nations, they would be his special people. They would be the people that uh, he, he would delight in, his heart would delight in. And out of this sense of belonging, we also see that or, or with that is a deep sense of purpose. Um, and, and that is what a fellowship is all about too. So again, if you have a look at definitions of the word fellowship, it talks about a group of people who have a common purpose and that's what helps to unite them. And certainly God gave his people, the Israelites, a, a sense of purpose, a new purpose, a new reason for being a people, not just simply because they're descendants of the same forefathers long ago, but here we see that he tells them that they will be for him a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Holy meaning set apart, dedicated for a specific purpose. And what is that purpose? It is to be a kingdom of priests. Now, amongst the Israelites, we, we will, if you read on in the story further on, uh, you get into Leviticus and in Deuteronomy, we read about how the, the Levites, the tribe of Levi, the Levites, uh, they would be the specially chosen ones to be priests uh, to the nation of Israel. And their role as priests was to be mediators. They would represent the people to God and, and God back to the people. Their, their role was to teach the people about God and uh, to represent them and to offer sacrifices on their behalf. And so th this is the role of, of, a, of a priest, to mediate, to teach, and to reveal to the people what God is really like and to help them to know how to worship God and how to be in a right relationship with God. And so, although that was true of the Levites, here we see that God was saying that this was his intention, his purpose for the whole nation of Israel to be a kingdom of priests to the whole world. That means to you and I. And so that brings us back right back to us today. Here we see that uh, as, as you follow the story through, if, if you get right up to the New Testament and, and skip all, over a whole lot of history of the way that God dealt with his people, uh, even when they didn't keep the covenants and still God remained faithful. And finally, we come to when Jesus Christ, our Lord, when he came, the Son of God came to this earth and he was the, the, the true fulfillment of, of the Israelites, of the Jews. Um, and, and through them, uh, as we see, read the book of Acts, we see how God used the Jewish people as they were scattered throughout what's called the diaspora, the many nations, as the apostle Paul and other apostles uh, take the, the message in the gospel and they would first visit the Jews and through them the Gentiles uh, throughout uh, the rest of the world. And so here we see the playing out of the rest of that story. And I think there's yet to be a greater fulfillment of that uh, as we read in Revelation. But it brings us all back uh, in looking at what does it does mean for us today. Um, what, what's the significance of all of this? We've already looked at a little bit of it, of uh, uh, 
how, uh, or what it means to come to the mountain, come to the presence of God. But I want us to focus now as we finish up this morning to think about the idea that, that God wants us to be in a special relationship with him. He wants us to be in a deeper sense of fellowship with him. That he wants us to, to realize that, that he carries us. You know, in the hard times, it, it's, it's hard sometimes to be aware of God's presence. And we all go through experiences like that. And, and we may be together going through that part of our journey uh, together and and more and more as we see the economic uh, implications of the coronavirus uh, biting deeper. Uh, and, and we might go through some, some hard times, but we need to remember that even in the hard times, even in the rough parts of the journey, the Lord is carrying us through it. We can't escape it. He, the, Jesus said that uh, in this world, we will have trials, we will have tribulations, we'll have difficult times. Uh, we should even expect persecution. But he said that he would carry us through it. And this is a wonderful promise as we consider uh, what our future might hold, uh, that he will be there for us and he will bring us to himself. And ultimately, this is the fulfillment, isn't it? We know that uh, in many places throughout scripture, including the prophets in the Old Testament, uh, there was this uh, idea of the mountain of God uh, that, that place where, where God was seated on high. And it's speaking of heaven. And ultimately, this is what God will do. This is what the Lord will do. He will carry us through our journey in this world. We have to be prepared to, to throw off all that is of this world and be ready to, to, to have a look at, at, perhaps take more seriously, what is it that prevents us from entering into real fellowship with the Lord now? Uh, and uh, being the kingdom of priests uh, that he calls us to be now. But remembering that ultimately it would all be fulfilled when he brings us into his presence on his holy mountain. And then uh, we will all worship the Lord in, in real spirit and truth. So I hope that this is a word of encouragement for you this morning. And to keep this in mind, that even through the hard times, the Lord is able to carry us through and bring us into deeper fellowship in his presence. Let's pray. Lord, our God, we're, we're thankful for your faithfulness. Uh, you do what you say you will do. And Lord, we can't always see uh, the, the road ahead. And we're not always sure why it takes this turn or that turn. Lord, we're not always sure why it is that you allow us to go through hard times. But we're thankful, Father God, that you delight in us, your people, as we are now the redeemed people from amongst all the nations of the world, as the gospel has gone out. And Lord, we're thankful that you are faithful to those that you have redeemed, that we belong to you, that you delight in us, and that you are bringing us through this journey because your purpose is that we should see you at work in wonderful ways and bring others along on this journey. Lord, help us to remember that while we are on this earth, this is still our role to be that kingdom of priests representing you to others around us. And Lord, bringing them to you in prayer. Lord, help us to have that urgency about us uh, to be representing others before you in prayer, but also, Lord, to take the good news of Christ. Father God, to be bringing the revelation of, of God, of you to other people around us. And Lord, that as we do, that we will journey together as you draw us to yourself. Lord, for now, in deeper fellowship with you as you enable us by your spirit. But knowing, Lord, that, that we have this living hope. Lord, may, uh, may that carry us through the, through the hard times, the difficult times. Lord, that we have this living hope that one day we will be with you in glory. And so we ask it, Father, for Christ's glory. Amen.